there everybody thank you for watching my channel time lord tv and this is on the bank with the wonderful helen Pethybridge. hi helen how are you i am very good how thank are you, you. Owen? i'm good thank you and thank you very much for coming down to this wonderful location it where hardly gorgeous. anybody fishes so i'm not going to tell people where it is no. because i like <laughs> be like last night it was all to myself nobody else here so i that love coming gorgeous. here and resetting all oh, little fish there as well you keep fish don't you you were telling me yes yes we keep them uh in a pond <laughs> not a beautiful lake like this well we've got two we've got a little wildlife pond with no fish but lots of newts and frogs and oh, excellent dragonflies and mayflies etc and uh and then a koi pond yes yeah and at the moment i've seen so many dragonflies today they're really out and they've been dappling around the water so they're probably doing a bit of mating laying of eggs and stuff so um yeah it's beautiful here and i've caught my very first sturgeon as well you haven't seen a picture of that i've never caught a sturgeon it was um about the ones on the bottom are they they are yeah. they are yeah they have very sort of they're, they're a bit like head? sharks they yes. look a bit like a very small shark sort of but the mouth is at, yeah. yeah mouth is at the very bottom under here yeah and um it was about 25 pounds so it's it's decent size. They fight like crazy. Um, then I, <laughs> this morning I caught a golden, and I've got a picture of it, and I'm holding it up, and the sun's shining on it. I've got orange on my face. It's, <laughs> it's reflected most, the yeah, reflected glory of your the, fish. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. So this on the bank series, just yeah. sitting here, talking to people, chatting to people about life and so on. So going back a bit, not a whole sort of lengthy biography but where were you born where did you grow up so i was born in maidenhead all right not far no oh, i'm not going to say much no no it's miles away miles away miles away miles away but yes no i was born in maidenhead uh went up to leeds for uni okay ended up in north london and now we're back in in wickham so we've almost done full circle right okay and um have you got siblings so i had a sister all oh, right okay. um but she uh, passed away 15 years or so ago. Right, so, okay. yes. Okay, it's always hard when that sort of thing happens. Um, okay, so you, so you had a sister, she passed away, as you say, 15 years ago. Is that the sort of event that's affected you in your life? Because my brother took his own life, I've had various other events and so on. Did, has it affected you, that sort of thing? Um, Probably not so much as it might do others. She was quite disabled, so right. uh, very poor eyesight, I'm partially sighted, but very, very partially sighted. Uh, also had a, a, a dodgy hip and a dodgy elbow, so um, and some learning difficulties. So we were very, very different. So right. Right, okay. So was there a sort of preparedness that... No, no, it was a aneurysm, is it? The blood oh, clot? Right, no, okay. so it was totally sudden. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. But okay. Okay. So you went to university, you say? Yes. What did you study there? I studied geology. Right. Okay. So that's rocks. And rocks and fossils. Volcanoes. Volcanoes, volcanic, sedimentary, tectonic metamorphic. Plates. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Okay. So you studied that. Why geology? What interest did you have there? So uh, that stemmed from flunking my A-levels. Okay. So. <laughs> you don't strike me as somebody who will flunk things. No, I don't. It was my first mishap, really. And as my mum said, if you're going to mess up something, you know, the driving, driving test, that would have been a much more appropriate one. A-levels, not such a great idea. Why did you flunk them, do you think? I think um, I had the Christmas before, Christmas before A-levels? Yeah, the Christmas before A-levels, I'd been out to Australia um, with the Scouts on their annual, no, that annual that happened every four years, World Jamboree. Oh, right. And it was an absolutely amazing experience, um, mixed in with you know, this huge campsite, 108 different nationalities. I actually can't remember that much about the activities we did. What I can remember is standing in queues. Right, okay. Because you just queued up with Tahitians and Indonesians and people from all over the world. And 
that was my memory of having these amazing conversations standing in queues. So I was very happy queuing. Was that your first experience of exposure to different cultures and so on? I mean, I've been travelling on holiday and stuff, yeah, yeah. but in quite a sort of, you know, sanitised environment. Room? But Go not on. this, this, you know, people just being themselves, yeah, not yeah. on holiday, just very natural. So, um, and just very intense. So it was a absolutely brilliant experience. Three weeks um, there and stayed with a family in Australia, either end, one in Perth, one in Tasmania, and um, still in touch with the Tasmanian. Oh, right. So uh, it's a girl that we friendship. stayed with, you know. Um, and uh, I do remember going back to school, uh, all girls school. I was head girl. And you had to stand outside the hall at assembly and collect everybody's sickness letters and stuff. And I was just like, well, wow, here I am in my, we were all still school uniform in sixth form at that time, and my regulation socks and what have you. And it's like, three weeks ago, I was having this amazing experience. And I sort of, I think I kind of grew up massively, or I don't know, doors opened, or mentally, I just remember coming down and go, oh, this is ever so yeah. small and narrow. Um, so I think unconsciously that was going on, consciously. So were, were you head girl when you failed A-levels? Yeah. A-level year? Because some people are head girls year before and they don't do it during A-level No, year no, during the A-level, yes. That was right. not great. Going into the headmistress's office, which everybody did, who needed her support to get into university, and said, I wasn't expecting you to see you okay. here. <laughs> so, so you've been on Jamboree, yeah. you're head girl, you come back and you find this almost straight jacket, straight lace situation. Yeah. I found that I went to Kenya to support a project years and years ago. And when I came back, it's just a completely, uh, it's a disjointed life almost, isn't it? Yeah. You, 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 it's reality of, or your normal reality is very different. And your horizons you are just sort of shifting yeah, 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 out horizons. massively. Yeah. Yeah. So going back then, ask you this question. If you had your time again, would you take A-levels or Jamboree? Jamboree. Every time? Yeah. Why is that? Because eventually I recovered the A-levels. I mean, it was, and that was probably um, a bit life-shaping in itself. So, so I had an offer to go to Bristol, an offer to go to Birmingham to do geography. Right, okay. Which I really enjoyed. So associated with geography. So yeah, physical yeah. geography was, was what I really wanted to do. Uh, came out, missed both those offers. Mum gave me half a day of moping and then handed me the ACAS book. ACAS? UCAS? Whatever it was called. UCAS, yeah. UCAS book. Ucker, I think it was in those days. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And the phone. <laughs> Basically, it was find yourself a place. So, uh, which I did by the end of the afternoon. Um, and I could either go sort of red brick, ex poly, okay, geography. Yeah. Sorry. Ex poly type geography or red brick geology. Okay. And I went red brick geology. Which one? Leeds. Leeds. Okay. Uh, which I, of course, had never visited. All this, you know, yeah, yeah, go yeah. round the mill, you know, go and see where you want to go. Never visited it. My friend had been there, liked it. I remember her saying she liked it. I was like, that'll do. Um, and it's quite away from Maidenhead. Yeah. Because some people go to university, especially now to save costs, they go to university from home. And that, to me, defeat, I never went to university. But if you're going to go to university, you've got to leave home. I mean, oh, exactly. I was also going to, whether I was in Bristol or Birmingham, that was yeah. going to be leaving home. So whether it was a hour yeah, yeah. train or two hour and a half train, it was... Yeah. But according to... Do you remember Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister? A little bit, yeah. Okay. Do you remember Sir Humphrey? Yes, the guy, yes. The yeah. civil service yeah. guy. I always remember one line from this, where the minister, or he was Prime Minister, can't remember, in the, in the comedy sitcom... Um, he's trying to revise universities and so on. And so Humphrey goes, but it will ruin the universities, both of them. <laughs> 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 to me, that yes, is one of the yes, best lines. And it's them. the epitome of how university used to be seen. Yes. But that isn't always the case because there are other universities that are far better than Oxbridge and Cambridge. Oh, and uh, it depends what you uh, want to study. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yes, so, yes. Yeah, so, uh, so you go off to Leeds... Yes. You failed A levels. You're not doing the subjects you want. Uh, how did you then cope at Leeds then? And it's not the place you wanted to go to. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Right. 
So I got there and in Freshers Week, there was five of us. I mean, in one week in the site, I mean, it's a big university. I found five of us and there were only all five of us who'd actually been either on the Jamboree or the associated, oh, wow. um, there was a European uh, event for those who didn't want to or didn't get onto the yeah. Jamboree. It was a massive selection to get onto it. Um, and we found it, so we found them. And uh, I really enjoyed it because it was the physical side of geography I wanted to do. So it was only a, a half gap. The, the biggest upset was I had to do chemistry and I hated it. But we had a laugh. Yeah, but chemistry is not real science because only physics is real science. So don't worry about that. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm going to get slated. <laughs> oh, I'm pressing my bike. Oh, it's nothing happening. No, yeah, don't want to miss no, any action. Happening, no. no, no. OK, so you loved it. So what would you say? Uh, do you remember during pandemic, the um, A-levels were mismarked or something? Yeah. I didn't know. And people saying, oh, you've ruined my life and all the rest of it. What would you say? to people who place so much value on A-levels and those students who said it was ruining their lives and all the rest of it? I think it's always recoverable. Yeah. Um, so I worked darn hard. I got my 2-1 and I was determined to. Right. And that was well my, done. you know, yeah. yeah that's so you with, didn't get a Desmond? Uh, no, I got, got what I needed. And then where it really hurt, though, was then getting your first job. Right, OK. Because everybody looked at your A-levels almost more, but as well as your degree. Because when yeah. you're doing the milk round, you haven't actually got your final degree yeah. at that point. You've got your A-levels. And computer said no, because oh. mine weren't good enough for so, um So I passed them, but not, you know, whatever it was, two season a day. It wasn't yeah, yeah, yeah. enough to get the jobs I wanted to. So, so, and this is where just sticking with it is there is recoverable but I think I did 80 to 90 applications in my final year oh, for jobs for a job didn't get any of them uh, then I did I, I knew at that point I wanted to do HR and I was sitting there with a geology degree so I got the wrong degree and um, the wrong A level yeah, grades yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so then I went and did my uh, Institute of Personnel Development qualification full time, went home, did that in Slough. And then I had to do another. And then even then the A-levels were hitting me. So I was now, I had my degree, I had my 2-1, I was qualified and they were still discounting me on my so A-level So people were still result. looking back, what, seven years or whatever it was, six, seven years yeah. previous. They weren't taking into account what you'd done recently yeah so it was yeah five years previous and uh and then i did get my lucky break but that was again after about 70 80 applications so okay. was it luck was it luck that i got my lucky break it had to come at some time because i'd done so many darn applications exactly you yep. see i believe in life in sport i'm, I'm avid watcher of sport lots of sports that you make your own luck it's like you know, people go, I don't know, last season Arsenal lost because of referee's decision yeah. against Brentford. Well, hang on a minute, that's one match out of all of these. Yeah. Or England at the moment are failing at the test match, the amount of catches they've dropped. And that's the difference in one test match up at Headingley between Australia and England. Yeah. It's huge. Is, is yeah. their capability in the field. Mm. You know, they dropped the catch of a guy who made uh, over 150 or whatever it was, Marsh. And I believe very much that there is actually no such thing as luck. No, you that make your own luck. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, at that point, I was like, for goodness sakes, OK, I'll go as an HR admin and work my way up. And um, it was with Nortel, who are now gone bust, long after I left, I hasten to add. But um, so I applied for the admin role. <laughs> Got a couple of interviews for that role. They said, you should be on the graduate one. They put me into the graduate okay. one. So I did the graduate selection process. And then I actually got offered both on the same day. <laughs> you see, that's not luck. You've you, because you could have given up after 40 applications. Yeah. You could have given up after 60. You could have given up after two. I could have only gone with the graduate ones instead of going yeah, to the admin yeah, ones. Yeah, exactly. But so I ended so up never. on the graduate program. So but yeah. I really don't believe that that's lucky. I think it's determination, focus. And bloody-mindedness. <laughs> and bloody-mindedness, yeah. 
<laughs> and and you've gone from jamboree head girl failed a levels <sighs> etc and doing a degree you don't want in a city you've never visited you've probably never been north of birmingham in your life apart from on holiday <laughs> yeah. and there you are you're doing it and now you've got a job okay yeah so how did the job go job was great i um uh it was a rotational one, so you moved around different jobs every six months. So uh, started in Mainhead, then I had well, I had every job has its highs and lows, doesn't it? Uh, that was my good grounding, lovely supportive team. Then the next placement was um, did I go to Opto Electronics? Oh, I got married then. That was good. Oh right, okay. yeah. So I came back really confused and with a different surname. Then um, yeah, the headcount went a bit wonky that month. <laughs> I think I got double counted. I had nine months down at Opto Electronics plant in um, Paynton. Mm -hmm. Loved it there because um, it's a really quite a junior team and then the HR manager. Um, and, uh, and then going in as the grad with some experience already in one previous place and he, the, the manager just chucked stuff at me. So that was where I got all my core base experience i was hiring i was disciplining you know i heard i sat with him as he did his the first uh, dismissal and you just pick up that language and how to do it in a very um fair empathetic but clear way mm. um and so i got so much experience jammed into that nine months it was absolutely brilliant so why HR? Why did you enjoy it? Because, I mean, I was a field sales manager. Mm. Uh, they always gave us long titles, but I was a field sales manager for a while. And we we're always told that on recruitment or if somebody's failing in the job, you're doing them a favour by actually showing them the door and persuading them or whatever. Disciplinarians. Yeah. There was a disciplinary process, but it was a lot lighter touch than it is today. Yeah. Um, so do you, do you see that, that on HR it's two sides, isn't it? You're recruiting somebody who's fantastic. Yeah. And then you are going through a disciplinary or dismissal procedure. Do you see it as being doing people, not a good deed, I I'm struggling for the words, but do, doing some good for people, helping them on their journey, if you like, whether they're recruited or whether they're dismissed. Do you think it's doing them good? How do you see it? I think, um, well, recruiting, you're, I think, always doing good yeah. if you've got the right person because you've matched their aspiration and your role and their skills and what you need. Um, so that, I think, is always positive. Um, on the exit side, there's two very different ways of, you know, there's the dismissal, performance type dismissal yeah. or your redundancy, and those are such different situations. Um, and I think they've got, the process is there for a really good reason because some people just lose their way a bit or there's something going on in their lives or something and they just get a bit off beam and actually having those conversations as early as, as, early as possible can yeah. help them back on track and you've saved the business and the individual you're all still happy together again because you're all back on track again and that can and does happen yeah um you just need an open mind. Um, sometimes it doesn't. In that case, it, it's likely your sort of round peg in a round hole is now a round peg in a square hole, or you know, the role roles change over time, individuals change over time, and there's just not a match. Priorities change over time. Mm. People have a start a family, get married, go. Uh, you have re, re changes, etc. And it just isn't a match anymore. Um, and then the performance drops off. I mean, sometimes yeah. you can then rematch it. It depends how open that and honest that conversation is. Um, or as I say, they move on to something which is better suited to where they are now. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Redundancy is, is very different because that's no fault of their own. That's a reduction yeah, in, that's the, circumstances of whatever in the in type the, of work yeah. and, and that I've feel very strongly you know the best then I'm absolutely 100% focused on doing the best thing for the individual how can you set them up for the next role the best how can you give them the best clarity 
uh, of their situation and timeliness of it. And, you know, you hear some absolute mm. shockers about how people are um, communicated with and handled through those situations. And it's just not necessary. So you're doing all of this HR and, 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 and so on, things like that. You're learning, you're gaining and so on. And you're married. Um, did kids come along and you take a break from work and so on? What happens next in Helen Pelham? So, uh, yes, yeah, so I leave Nortel, uh, go to Diageo, um, because Nortel was really technical and I've got to the point where I'm sitting on a management team and they're discussing the business of the business. And I'm like, I haven't got a clue about, you know, big switching systems and it actually doesn't interest me that much. So. Uh, yeah, I went to grandma alcohol, I could understand that. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> right, okay. Uh, went through the merger, which became Actually, Diageo. I know that of you. You like, you, you like gin, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm still loyal to Bombay. Um, <laughs> I'm very brand loyal to my, my career brands. Excellent. Um, and, um, yes, yeah, so at Diageo, I had um, my two maternity leaves. Okay. Wasn't great on maternity leave. I I can't imagine you would be. No. It wouldn't be that you don't don't value kids and having kids and love them and all the rest of it. It's just you strike me the time I've known you that you like to get in there and the nitty gritty of life. And do and something do and something. have something really. Uh, and I think no matter the how dedicated the mum or dad might be, sometimes you need to talk about things other than nappies and development of absolutely. a child when they're walking or talking. Absolutely. I yes, those and and different people go into motherhood yeah. and parenthood in different ways. Um, I remember a comedian on uh, Would I Lie to You? She's saying or something like this. An Asian lady, forget her name. She said, "I do love my children, but they are boring as babies." <laughs> well, I go, go and come know. home, and I go. Well, what have you done? Well, I've I've changed nappies, fed, yeah, and a huge achievement. I ironed two things. And the most interesting thing I've done is listen to Woman's Hour. <laughs> and I'm like, this is what my life's reduced to. So, um, I, uh, yeah, I did four months maternity leave. Right, okay. And um, then went back to work. And, yeah, we were balanced. And, and I think it's okay to say that, isn't it? I'm, I think, you know, we have to be, for me... Women can be really, mothers can be really tough. Mm. on other mothers especially yes. new mothers judgmental very judgmental and i think it comes from a place of this is my theory anyhow you have to believe you are doing the right thing yes because you're doing it for you and your child and your family so you have to believe you're doing the right thing which unfortunately often transmits as somebody doing something different must be therefore doing, doing the wrong. wrong thing rather than a different thing um, which, you know, was tough at times um, because most people did not go back to work no. that quickly or indeed back full time at all or no. whatever. But for me, that, that was right. I met a lady once from America. She felt called to have children. She had 14. And that's fine for her. Yeah. But that's not the calling of many people. No, no. Do you so know I think what I mean? it's do what works for, for your. You. You, your family, your, yes. An environment. Okay. An environment, yeah. So then you're back at work and so on. Uh, move it forward a little while. I don't know how far. But you then decide to become a business coach. Why was that? Leaping from... Yes. I mean, I can see that there's a connection there, you know, of communication, yeah. of disciplinary, yeah, yeah. dismissal, recruitment. But, and, and you're well positioned for this as well, I would imagine we'll come on to it a bit about experience failure in life and recovery, yeah, if you like. Yeah. So, so why did you make that change and what effect did that have? Yeah, so it was, I'd had an itch to run my own business for a, quite a while. Um, I spent one summer holiday. <laughs> we got a villa over the pool and um, Guy, my husband, did a lot of travel to the US. He was there like almost every other week or between there and the Middle East. Anyway, he got these torpedoes, toy pedos, oh, yes. yeah, yeah, the yeah, rubber yeah. things, and you like shoot them underwater. Yeah. So he brought that. We we're having great fun in the pool with the boys doing this. And I'm like, oh, well, what about an import?
import business of bringing these into the UK because you can only get them in the US. So uh -huh. I literally spent the time around the pool, literally scraps of paper because I hadn't even taken a notebook on holiday. And um, I was doing the business case. Well, how many, how many would you need to sell? Oh, how okay. many pools are there? What's the kind of... How so you're many doing houses a bus business have got analysis and cost analysis. Yes. And then, well, would I actually be, would you, I bet the local authorities wouldn't yet let you use them in a public pool, so we have yeah, to be, probably not. so we've only got private pool, anyhow, so I spent three days doing this and concluded this was not going to be a flyer, so, <laughs> but I loved doing it, I loved doing right, it, okay. I had a ball, and then um, doing lots of org change and restructuring and stuff in my later years in corporate, and getting the stage, uh, it'll be another one next year. <laughs> Same old, same old, uh, but in great organisations. So why would I leave, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. this yeah. top-notch, you know, Pepsi What's Cody, the attraction Agio. to move when you're going to be doing the same old, Why same would old? I go to a lesser organisation, yeah. less strategic organisation or whatever? So I really wanted something quite different um, with this thing about doing my own business. And so I was thinking, well, I could set up, a lot of HR people then go and be um, executive coaches right. on the personal development side, coaching back into corporates. But if I'm honest, that wasn't what I did no. in corporates. So why would no. I do that? I, I, my, I just don't think my credibility would be there selling it back in when I hadn't really done that. In. Yeah. So, um, so I was looking at doing that for SMEs. And then I, before I did that, this was a pivotal moment, I went training organization design to the Southeast Europe team in Istanbul. And at that time, the flight, the rules where you could fly business class, a flight of four hours. Heathrow to Istanbul is exactly four hours. So I'm sitting up front, a nice comfy seat, and um, there's this chap next to me, and we get talking, and it turns out he's an architect. I've got no idea where he was going to Istanbul, but anyhow, he was leading his practice and he'd got about 18 people in the practice. And he actually had not a Scooby-Doo how to get the best out of right, them okay. at all. He was doing nothing, nothing. No team meetings, no one-on-ones, no development plans. No appraisals, nothing. No appraisals, nothing happening there. So um, basically, he had four hours of free HR consultancy and I had a four hour window into the SME world that I have no idea about. And he was like, this is great. I'm, oh, I can do that next week. I'm going to talk to that. I can do this. And I was like, wow, the, the impact and the speed of response and the speed of implementation was so different. And I just found it really rewarding. Taking somebody on that journey of possibilities. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And seeing him. And I was like, I've of course, I wasn't used to networking, so I never asked for a card or anything. Yeah, yeah. So, but I'd love to know what he did and how he went. Um, but after that, then I thought, okay, maybe HR for SMEs. But then I was like, well, how do I go on holiday? Somebody's got a yeah, disciplinary yeah. situation. How am I going to do that? And then I was like, oh. Then I was ended up uh, maybe looking at a franchise. One thing there'd be some support there. Ended up on the Franchise Association website, and there was this button called business services I went, well, what's business services click and um and it was business coaching so i was like well, what's business coaching and i was like oh so i could get the bit i loved which was partnering with the the leader yes. the gms and the vps and supporting them with their leadership teams i could do all of that and instead of just playing in sort of team people leadership i could play in sales, marketing, ops, finance yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. And because I'd sat on the Walker's Crisp Stop board and the Quaker Tropicana op board, I'd got that general business knowledge at a level that you needed to be a coach and to understand what was going on. Um, and I was like, oh, this is the new challenge. So I get my SMEs and I get a, a new intellectual challenge, if you like, broadening out yeah, from yeah. HR. Yeah. Okay, so now you're helping businesses and so on. So just to sum up then, what do you do now if people haven't got it yet? What do you do for your clients? So I fulfil a few key roles. Um, for all of them, all my clients, I hold them accountable to do what 
they want to do to get to where they want to get to. Because in SMEs, the leader, the owner, it's the owner that I work with generally, um, there's nobody holding them accountable, there's no boss, yeah. there's no shareholders, uh, and therefore it's easy to slide and let themselves down. Yes. So if they've told me they want to achieve this, turn over this achievement, do something there are with the these team, steps whatever. And you hold them accountable to I help steps. them work out the steps and then I hold them accountable to, yeah, we're doing that, how are we doing, mm. etc. So accountability is a big one. Um, a lot of people, you know, the business owners I work with are trained, qualified in the thing of their business. Yeah. Not in how to run a business. Yeah. So that's where I can sort of partner up with them. They've got the knowledge of their business. I've got the knowledge of business. <laughs> Yeah. And and so it's a. I'm a business coach, but I'm as much a teacher, mentor as much as coaching, because I very practical approach to helping them get a cash flow forecast in place if they haven't yeah. done it. Really quiz them on their USP because most of what people say is their USP is not it's actually. Not. No, very I learned unique. that many years ago. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, push them yeah. and challenge them because nobody else is. Well, it's been wonderful in this wonderful, wonderful picturesque setting. Just taking time out <laughs> on the bank with the wonderful Helen. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's been much. a lovely way to spend the yeah. end of the week. <laughs> what a way to finish up the week. I know, I know. I know it's lovely. And I've got another night here and tomorrow, hopefully my granddaughter's coming to oh, super. fish as well. So. <laughs>